Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Papa Culture Show with Lilith Dorsey and Jason Winslade, where we dig into the crossroads of the occult, media, and popular culture. Lilith Dorsey, author, filmmaker, voodoo priestess, and cinema and television scholar. And I'm Jason Winslade, performance studies, media, and religion scholar. And today we are talking about The Craft Legacy, a sequel from Blumhouse Productions to the 1996 classic teen witch movie, The Craft. The new film was written and directed by Zoe Lister Jones and was released on video on demand just last month. Uh, and we, uh, we have very different takes on it. <laughs> so this is going to be interesting. Um, you know, I, uh, I finally got a chance to see it. And if you haven't, um, please do, because we're going to be talking about the whole thing with some spoilers. And um, Spoiler you know, alert, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. So we're just going to get to that. Um, so yeah, you know, I... I had a particular uh, take on the craft, you know, seeing it back in 96 and, uh, and then again recently. Um, and, you know, that the craft has a place in all of our sort of history of pop culture stuff. That was a huge part of when I first started writing about uh, witchcraft and paganism, popular culture in the late 90s. So it's, it's, it kind of looms large. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I think that for me, I first of all, let me say, I personally am happy we chose this film because I get to say we are the weirdos repeatedly <laughs> in the next half hour, which, you know, growing up and, and being a witch in that time was sort of our iconic phrase. You know, I was not a teenager, but I was still a young witch when the film came out. And it really, it was iconic. I think that the portrayal of witchcraft was one we hadn't really seen in this particular context of the time. Uh, unfortunately for me, it's not aging well. And uh, as you said, we had very different opinions of this remake. So I'm happy to get into it. I'm happy to talk about all the different nuances and uh, disagreements that we're gonna have today. <laughs> about this. I mean, I don't know if it's just my yeah. coming from, you know, whatever, my particular background or whatnot, but we did have just what we were seeing on the screen, we completely disagreed about. So uh, I'll let you start talking about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, just, you know, general context and broad uh, comparisons. And uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I think, you, you, you can't really talk about this this sequel without in some way uh, making an analogy with the original in terms of its role in, uh, you know, in the O culture, uh, uh, you know, around paganism, witchcraft in, in the late 90s and in 96. Uh, and yeah, for me, that was when I was really getting moving with my uh, involvement in the pagan community in Chicago. And I, I'd only been here for like a year at that point. Um, and it was something that because of uh, the trends that were happening at the time, it was right around the time of the, of the Teen Witch kit, the Silver Raven Wolf, uh, all of that stuff uh, involving, uh, you know, it was right before, right before Buffy. Of course, it, it, it you know, laid the groundwork for things like Buffy and Charmed and all of that. And it, and it definitely played a role in how witchcraft was seen by the mainstream and by the, the, the general public. Now this new film is in a very different place. Uh, and, and, and that's reflected in how witchcraft is presented on the screen in that we are, uh, it's, it's, more, it's more taken for granted that this, this is a thing that happens. It's not, you know, the, the original film was, you know, it had a, a, the tone of being a horror film and even though it's Blumhouse, the this, this sequel does not, it's not really horror film at all. Um, it's more just, you know, the witchcraft is presented a lot more casually. It's sort of, you know, part of the atmosphere. Uh, you know, the, we have, you know, the sort of goth rebels in the 90s, and now you've got the, the TikTok Instagram witches who are, you know, doing it for uh, you know, they have their, they, they have their positive, you know, good reasons, but it still has that sense of, of a different kind of trend. Uh, you know, there is more fashion 
involved with it. Um, I, was, I was thinking, you know, a brief scene where they have a bully, uh, you know, he's, he's bullying, it's an anti-gay bullying thing, and they turn his, his jacket into a rainbow thing. And it's, it's not like, you know, deep, dark, angsty vengeance. It's, I'm going to flip this around on you and make you seem silly. And that seems to be the, the sort of ethos around what witchcraft means here. Uh, so there's a lot going on. I mean, all, all, all of the critics have said very similar things that it's, it's trying too hard to be woke. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's taking this, this thing and making it less threatening, but that's kind of what it is though these days, um, as opposed to what it would have been in the nineties where it was still, uh, you know, seen it as somewhat rebellious and, and, um, you know, seen it as, as they're, you know, outsiders. And where, whereas these witches are, I mean, they're, they're not mainstream, they're not part of the mainstream in their school, but they're not aggressively weirdos as, well, as, you know, <laughs> as referenced in the original film. There's, there's, there's a lot, you know, different attitude there. And there are more, uh, you know, they seem to be a little bit more supportive of each other and not so much into turning on each other. And, you know, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but, but when we, you know, how we, we, we frame women in Witches of Eastwick and then the craft and then this, there, there's definitely an evolution there. Um, so yeah, there's, you know, this, this was intended by the directors and writer, uh, uh, Zoe Lister-Jones to be a corrective of some sort uh, on the original uh, because there were a lot of issues that that she you know says that she had with the way that the women were portrayed so there's 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 a lot of intention here in terms of reframing this I think in a lot of ways though it misses the mark and this is one of the things that we disagreed upon yes it's a Blumhouse production, so we do have this kind of horror thing, but so much of it felt contrived to me. And that really disappointed me about them. You know, I've seen some of their more recent offerings. I can't remember what it was called, but there's one with uh, Felicia Rashad is this evil doctor. And so <laughs> there's lots of these things coming on where I really felt like representation was, I mean, racially in a different way because we don't see this. This has been, you know, ever since we've got the sort of modern kind of thing where we are seeing more black horror out there thanks to some of these you know great offerings recently and, and these great directors so to me i was sort of enthused because i thought we were going to have this transformation and we'll talk more about the racialization as we move on but i did think we were going to have a transformation of the rachel true character you know which for me as a black witch was iconic this was the first time we could see them in this context and then they set us up all the way along with the magic. You know, we've got Lily that we discover is Lilith, and that's obviously not lost on me since my name is Lilith. We've got all this imagery coming in about, you know, feminine power and, and the actual goddess lore and, and all of that snakes and, and, you know, whatever, the sacred feminine is also the secret feminine. And, and all of these elements are coming to the fore, as my dear friend used to say. <laughs> But what are we really doing with them? What is the role of magic? What is the message that they're giving? And that for me was, you know, no offense to the director, but that for me was really truly disappointing because we've, we've set it up here in a dichotomy for me between male and female. These are, this is where we're coming at it from <laughs> here. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a vehicle that they used to sort of attack some of the toxic masculinity issues that the young women are facing. But on the other hand, I think it leaves us with more problems than it solves. And that was something that I thought was very disappointing about the text. Uh, we move now into these ideas of, of what are we actually representing when we're representing magic in the text. And this is something that I feel like we can't bypass. And it shows up in so many tropetastic ways again here that there's almost a sort of fetishization of the elements of witchcraft which for me always seems a little cheap and sleazy and hollywood because what we're and 
this goes to the extreme about that. I was describing it to a dear friend of mine this morning who hasn't seen it, but who's an accomplished practitioner of almost 50 plus years now. And I was like, and you know how they do the spell on the boy? They get the used condom and the bong. And it's just so like sleazy to me. It's, it's like, you know, in, instead of having witchcraft be a sacred thing, which I think would also have worked as a vehicle, it doesn't have to be this thing that's really taken to the lowest common denominator, as my priestess would say, like, let's literally drag witchcraft through the gutter in this scene. And it just makes it so, I don't know, it just left a bad, <laughs> I was going to say the used condom left a bad taste in my mouth. There's, <laughs> there's my statement for today, but it did literally, that scene I just thought was cheap and for effect and, and it didn't work for me. If anything, it was distasteful. I'm not going to go sign off on some of these, you know, I don't belong to any of these witches anti-defamation leagues that we've mentioned before, although they are out there. And if I did, I probably would raise an issue about this because it's, it's not, taking some of the sacredness and actually showing it to the younger generation, which is what I think in a way the first craft really did, that there were teeny bits of sacredness that were not cheapened and debased to this way. And, mm -hmm. and that I found very problematic. Um, I wanted to read a quote. Let me see if I can find it here about how for, to me, it, there also seems to be these issues of control going through the text over and over and over again. And these issues of control originally are played out in the form of the glamour. And Rachel Mosley has written a lot about this role of glamour and the teen witch and witchcraft, especially in the first craft. But I think there's a lot of these issues that are coming back to us over and over again, that this glamour represents a change of identity, which is something that we see with the girls. You mentioned before this transformation in the first craft, we've got a transformation of her eye color and Rachel too talks about a transformation of her hair possibly. But in this, we have more of an actual, you mentioned the TikTok IG witches. We've got a transformation where they all look shinier and more glamorous. Uh, I, I was thinking if, if we should have had a guest on this, it would have been Michael Herkus and his book about glam magic and Lilith and how Lilith really is, you know, as a goddess, all about making yourself, you know, one with sensuality and eroticism and shininess. And I think that they picked up on that. But to me, they didn't take it far enough. So this is something that I also had a problem with when we were talking about the actual magic, because to me, it seemed very superficial. It seemed very literally one dimensional. I'm not necessarily going to say that that was, you know, sort of male centric, but it does in a way doesn't seem to, it's still having this binary, which I'm not happy with, especially since we talk about the inclusion of having this trans character, which is something that we're going to talk about in a minute. So I'll let you introduce that segment. <laughs> yeah, um, I, mean, I, I think that there's, there, there's definitely something to be said here about just the way that the film frames the witchcraft. It, it, it's, it's, very, it's very glossed over. Um, you know, in, in the original film, the, the primary relationships in the film were between uh, the, the, the girls, uh, between Sarah and Nancy and, and, and Bonnie and Michelle. Whereas in this film, the primary relationships are really between the lead, Lily, and the family. Um, the, you know, the family is, is almost non-existent in the, in the first film. Uh, but so, so the, the, the three women who are the witches in this new film, they're kind of like window dressing in a way as is the witchcraft. Um, and, you know, like the original film, they had, uh, you know, the, I, I think they had, they had three advisors for this one. Uh, the main one was Pam Grossman, who's well known for her, uh, her book, Waking the Witch and, and Witch Wave and all those Kate Bush references. Um, th that apparently she designed some of the rituals and, and all this kind of stuff. But that was the weakest part of the movie for me. Although, although you know, there are a lot of things that I really loved about the movie that, that had to do with some of the emotional stuff that, that we probably won't get to uh, in, in this discussion. But the witchcraft stuff to me was the weakest because at a certain point it felt like, it felt like, um, you know, it was a superhero show all of a sudden. 
Like they were, they were just, they just had these powers and there wasn't really any explanation for them. And there wasn't anything like, you know, even though completely taken out of context in their first film, but the, you know, the Gardnerian Wiccan, uh, you know, initiation liturgy is in that first film, but there's nothing like that here. Um, so there's definitely something, I mean, you know, again, you know, Zoe Lister Jones had this whole thing about, you know, I, you know, she says, um, um, she wanted to put this message out that unlike the first film that basically said, you know, be careful what you wish for and, and, you know, women really can't be trusted with power. She wanted to say that, you know, that it's, it's not about the individual, it's about community. And that's when you get into, uh, you know, this stuff around, uh, you know, the, the conflict between patriarchy and, uh, you know, and female empowerment. So obviously the, the, the intention here is much more allegorical than it is uh, practical. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there are, there are a lot of things, you know, right away when you see Duchovny's character, David Duchovny's character, like, you know, he hugs without consent. Uh, you know, he's got his, you know, the whole family's biblical names, you know, Adam, Isaiah, Jacob, uh, Abraham, for Christ's sake. Uh, you know, there's, <laughs> you know, it's clearly like, you know, hitting you on the head with this thing. And then, of course, you know, you see that he's a, he's a self-help dude. He's basically Jordan Peterson, um, you know, and he uses this language that's like, you know, uh, we want to alchemize weakness and, and turn it into uh, sovereignty and all this stuff, you know. So there, there, there are all these ways in which, the, you know, even though we don't really see anything about it, that there's there's this undercurrent that okay there's this misogynist cult going on there that's you know underneath all this stuff and interestingly enough you know it, the whole thing about the original that in, the original film where the you know they worship Manon which this you know it's made up thing sounds almost Haitian I don't know um, and, uh, you know that, that that there's almost a sexual thing like you know we're going to evoke the spirit he's going to fill me and all this stuff and you know there's this there's this clearly patriarchal thing happening in that in the first film that that the new director wants to reject and only brings back the menon concept through the, the mouthpiece of the evil the evil patriarch um and so yeah i mean there's a lot of stuff in there and again like you know for me you know there was a lot of emotional stuff uh you know your your mileage may vary i mean i know some people uh they they felt that the the, the coming out scene uh, with the with the the I guess the Skeet Ulrich character uh, Timmy uh, who they cast a spell on to make basically more woke and he actually seems like a pretty awesome guy once they do that which is problematic because obviously there's all that stuff about consent that they acknowledge later on but still but yeah you know in the scene where he comes out as bi and he's crying like that that to me was a very emotional thing because it's like yeah under toxic masculinity, he can't be himself. And that, that, you know, there's that implication that they free him of toxic masculinity with their spell. But again, <laughs> it's pretty tricky, uh, you know. Uh, he dies in wise. the end. What are they freeing him from? I mean, well, it gets him he, dead. He dies, he dies in the end, but, but you know, but, but the implication is that he, and this, you know, this is where we, we read it differently, but the implication to me is that he dies because he's feminized. Because not not just because he's he's bi, but because he uh, he has from from the point of from the perspective of an MRA type, you know he's been he's been brainwashed by feminism, so he's weak. Therefore, he must be eliminated. Um, and that's that's sort of the attitude that 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 is brought out by these uh, you know by the Duchovny character. Um, so they I didn't see it as that at all. I totally yeah. did not see it as that at all. Like, I saw that as him being, you know, yes, being punished because he was gay, being killed because they need a sacrificial lamb. I did not read it. Even, even in the great dun -da 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 superhero ending moment, I did not read that as, oh, okay, we're, we're triumphing over, you know, David Duchovny and his male, you know, whatever dick lifting cult so i i saw it as yet another failure because and that's what for me where the glamour comes back into it because it's like he uses that against her so in a way 
they wow. can be all things. So it, it was that, oh, look, I can be your best friend, you know, and you won't even know until it's too late, you know? So for me, that was just him getting the upper hand over and over and over again. So that was disappointing to say the least. <laughs> There's this, and this is something again, that I said some of this earlier scholarship on, on glamor and, and witchcraft and teen witches, it's, it's been written about a lot when the, the movie first came out, but I still see this you know, problematic relationship that these young women, this, these young witches have with the feminist concepts and also these male dominated ideas of what it is to be a woman, what it is to be a witch. It's both dependent and dismissive of it at the same time, which is something that I find really problematic, you know, that it's, I can't just, you know, I can't be the witch in my, I got all dressed up today because th this is the message of the thing. You have to get to be all shiny in order to be a witch, you know, you have to be all dark and shiny and all Lilithy and all of that. And that has to come out in order for your power to come out. Like I can't be in my power. I know it's not sexy and it's not Hollywood. Well, I mean, I mean you know, everybody has their kink, but you know, it, it wouldn't be as sexy or it wouldn't be Hollywood at all if they just had their regular, you know, okay, I got jeans on, I got this other thing on, you know, like, I'm not They're guilty. Their oh, elemental really. colors, right? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> There's a whole thing about like they, they have their elemental colors going on. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, and that's it's, why. It's, it's Instagram witches. I know, but that's my message about, you didn't hear my joke about gilding the lily. This is literally gilding the lily. So we have to gild the lily in order to make ourselves more palatable for the mass market and more, more accepting of ourselves. Like that, that's what it comes with. So that was problematic for me if we're gonna talk about race, for me, this just took the whole tokenism concept to another level. I understand they wanna be inclusive, uh, but to me, it was like, all right, well, we gotta have the black chick still in there and let's throw a trans person in there as well. And then we'll be seen as, you know, we'll be woke and we'll get the woke pat on the back. And it didn't challenge the ideas of racism the way the first one did. You know, I mentioned that scene where she's talking about wishing that she had blonde hair, which the irony of it all is I know plenty of black people with blonde, natural blonde hair. I had blonde hair myself as a baby. So I think this is a white person's concept of, of what color hair black people have because <laughs> a lot of stuff went on and uh, some of us do have blonde hair. Uh, you know, I have yeah, that friend. was one of the things too about the, about the original is 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 that her Rochelle's entire character is is defined by her race. Like, like that's her, her her main problem is 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 racial. There's there's nothing to her other than race. Yes. No, but I I find that I find that plausible way more plausible than this character, this Lovey Simone character. For me, she had all these elements. It's like it went beyond tokenism that, that she almost seemed to have this kind of like clownish thing going on and what is she wishing for she's wishing for more black friends so this is is like she's made herself this outsider and then it's like it's beyond her control that she would have more black friends she has to get power in order to have more black friends and instead mm. of having the character focus on racial issues and racial injustice it's almost like she's put it on herself and that to me was a disappointing message that we're sending out there to all our younger people that because i, I don't think that needs to be said it certainly wasn't intrinsic to the story and i think it, it made it lose something from the original. And that to me, like I said, is way more Hollywood, way more all of the rest of this kind of thing that we're focusing on here. Disappointing, really. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I think it's I think it's clear that audience is a big issue here in terms of, of you know, who, the, who this movie is for. And, you know, I, I, there, there was a BuzzFeed article that, that, that I was reading that was basically like, you know, it, it corrects it corrects the politics of the first film, but it's not a it's it's not a better film. Um, that's what you know. That's what a lot of people seem seem to say. And and again, I mean, there there are parts of this that really you know w were touching emotionally to me. Um, but the whole thing too is that they're also setting up a franchise. And you oh, know sure. the way the way that we're left at the end really abruptly, you know, brings up a lot of 
problematic questions that I'm wondering how they're going to address in, you know, subsequent films. Yeah, I was reading a Guardian so, yeah. article that said it was just so cliche and so formulaic and so annoying, quite frankly, at this point, to be left with these weird little clues. You know, we don't know about, I mean, first of all, let me just say, as somebody who uh, <laughs> met Rachel True and had lovely conversations with her, and, you know, I, I am honored to have been able to thank her for the work that she did. I'm sad that it was Nancy that made it back into this film and not Rachel True. I right. hope that there will be other ones down the line, but for so many of us, you know, she was the whole movie. And unfortunately, what we've seen is, is her sort of get pushed to the side, even in, in some of the early publicity and things like that. So for me, to see this and then have that issue of race, which is still obviously, if not as, as much of an issue, a huge issue for young people today to just have that sort of like, oh, well, we're not gonna talk about that anymore. And it was disappointing to me, it really was. You know. Well, we're, we're definitely going to do an, a whole other, at, at least one or two other episodes about uh, about the legacy of the craft, the actual legacy of the craft uh, coming up. Uh, and we're also going to have a lot of other stuff coming up soon too. We're, we have our, you know, we, we record Lovecraft Country episodes uh, a little while ago when I was in New Orleans. I mean, we still got to air those. And we've got, you know, Supernatural ending. We got Sabrina coming back. Uh, we got all kinds of things coming up for you. Um, and as usual, we like to say, Help us out. Buy us a cup of coffee <laughs> at uh, www.ko-fi.com. <laughs> ko-fi.com. <laughs> and we're the Pop A Culture Show. Uh, pop A Culture Show. Uh, we just want to thank everybody, too, for watching us and for liking and subscribing to the YouTube channel. Hopefully, we're going to be able to keep doing this for some time to come, and we really appreciate all your support.